Be the church, which is what we're involved in, is to discover and to engage in some core devotions of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I think what we become experts at in American, the American version of Christianity, sure enough, is the discovery part. We're great at discovering things. And that the, the Christian life becomes an academic pursuit of just having the right information bouncing around between your ears. The engaged part is the part where I think a lot of the core devotions of the church that we're talking about, that's where there's a disconnect. And, and that's where we, we lose touch with really taking a step with God, really growing, really becoming, really experiencing God in His glory. It's in the engaged part. And we want to get to the engaged part of this story. Now, we're learning how to take some steps to become what God wants us to be. But we're also we lean into the me and God a lot and not so much the we and God and yet almost every reference to God's people Old and New Testament is plural it's about the we and God because God designed this to be done together God designed the Christian life God designed the life of faith to be lived in community so we're trying to change how we think about church the church is not just something you go to. It's a family you belong to. It's not just a location that you visit from time to time. We, we become the church, a community of faith that is transformational, inspirational, powerful. And it touches the community and touches the world with something that is of the eternal. And I think the reason why our country is in the dumper that it's in is because the church has been content to sit idly by with our hands neatly folded in a compartmentalized, carefully managed experience with God for way too long. And if we do it that way, we're going to find ourselves, as the church in America finds itself today, just a long way from God and a long way from having impact on, uh, on our nation. So for these next 30 days, we just want to see if maybe we can lean in the right direction and take a few steps forward in being what the church is really designed by God to be. Now, these five core devotions of the church, what we're focusing on, and last week we talked about community, and we talked about the importance of being a part of a genuine community of faith, a group of believers where you're going through life together in some tangible ways where you're experiencing love and encouragement and support, but we said that some people will walk into a class and they sit down and they cross their arms and they say, okay, what do you have for me today? And well, again, you can know you're supposed to do it, but to engage means you can't just be on the consumer end of this, but you become a contributor to the effort. You need to invest and engage with other people. And you're not just looking for the love and encouragement and support that others can give you, but you're being a person of love, encouragement, and support to others. So our weekly challenge last week is to commit to joining an intentional, in our, in our context, a Bible fellowship group where you can know and be known, serve and be served, love and be loved. And I pray that we'll just step beyond where we've been in relationship to one another, that a class won't just be studying again. I had no idea Israel was only that many miles long. I thought it was a lot bigger than that. Boy, what a great spiritual day this was in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And a whole lot of what we do that we call Bible study, we're going deep in the Bible. I've never met anybody who said that that actually was doing something with what they were deepening about, ever. It's always, we're, we really get into the Bible. Now, we don't ever get out of the Bible. We don't ever actually go and talk to somebody about Christ. We don't actually live a more holy life. We're just satisfied with, with learning a lot of Bible trivia. I think we should read from God's Word. (laughs) 
Acts chapter 2 is our core set of verses for what we're talking about, and we'll build some other things around that today, because today we're talking about the second core devotion of the church, and that is worship. Verse 42, at the end of the birth of the church in Acts 2, and they devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And, and day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. These members of this first church in Jerusalem, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. And Sometimes they were at the temple in larger gatherings, and sometimes it was home-to-home -home in smaller gatherings. And that's why we organize ourselves as a church between large gatherings and small gatherings. They, they ate together because there was just... Being together was so important. And they shared the Lord's Supper, communion together. They prayed together. And as a result, they were praising God, having favor with all the people. And this week, I want to talk to you about the power of worship. What is it and why is it important to us? Revelation 4 is the next place I wanted to look. And I'd like for you to make your way to Revelation 4. It's a scene out of heaven. John, in the Revelation, he records what he sees. And God uh, gave John, the apostle, these glimpses of heaven. And he records what he sees. This is a day when God's people are gathered around the Lord and the other created beings of heaven. They're these special beings that show up in the Old Testament. We see several references to them in the Revelation. They're in the mix A lot of you have had your brushes with greatness where you, you, you go to a restaurant and, oh my goodness, there's somebody from the Dallas Cowboys sitting at the next table. Or there's, there's some famous actor, some famous athlete, some hero of yours that you say, look, oh my goodness, we're, on the, we're in the same place at the same time. We're, I, here they are at Kroger. And I wonder what they're going to buy. And you have those brushes with greatness and, and you... People get excited about it all the time. There's celebrity sightings. Well, what if, what if you're in heaven with God, the Lord, the creator of everything? What is that feeling like? And, and, and how does that compare to the other? Well, I think the others uh, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we're going to read what happens when the people of God and these heavenly creatures gather before the Lord. Verse 9 of Revelation 4 says, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. They're praising God because he created all things, and he keeps all things going. And How do you feel about that? How would you feel to be in that setting? And most of us say, well, I think, I think if I was there... Man, it'd be just like being at church. They, the 24 elders falling down and these heavenly creatures singing their praise to God and, and the crowns being cast to the throne because nothing else is more important. And, and man, I'd be worshiping just like at home. I like that. That was good. That was a good one. Not so. I think everybody goes, goes, goes to the floor on this one. When you're in the presence of Almighty God, then chapter 7 of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And we'll read down to verse 12. Just a couple of pages over. 
He says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. People from everywhere, every tribe, every language, praising God because he saved them. The angels chime in. Apart from God, Apart from anything God has done, they're not, they're not overwhelmed just by what he has done. They're overwhelmed by who he is. If he never did anything else for you in your life from this day forward except for what he did for you at the cross, you could never, you'd spend all of it, you'll, we'll spend all of eternity thanking him and praising him for who he is as wise, powerful, strong, eternal. Here's, here's the thing. From these passages we see in Revelation, the truth about every human being and every other creature of heaven, we are wired for worship. And that's the first thing I wanted to focus on. We're wired for worship. Worship is important because we were made by God to give, to give glory to God, our creator. So this is, this is my iPhone. I use this every day, all day. As my calendar, it ha- I, I, I text with it, I email with it. It helps me find my way when I have misplaced my way, it, that GPS. In fact, I even use my phone to call people. I know it's not many people do anymore, but I actually still use my phone as a phone. And this little device, it... It reflects well on the people who made it, those folks at Apple, and uh, that's what a great, what a great creation uh, should do. It it reflects well on its maker, and that's what worship is. Worship is reflecting well, giving glory to the one who made us, and and to to function in a way that points back to the, the wonders of our maker. And sometimes, on a regular basis, the Bible says, we're to gather together with others to do that. To acknowledge our maker, to acknowledge our savior, to acknowledge the God who, who made it all and who holds it all together. And that's what worship is. The Bible's opening chapter, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And very good things give glory to the one who made them. And they just can't help it. This phone of mine is wired for communication, and, and we are wired to worship God. But the God who made us says, I, I want more in your worship than, than just giving me glory by doing whatever it is that you do. And we'll talk some more about that side of worship in a moment. But he says, give me glory by and he says it Old Testament, and he says it New Testament, by getting together every seven days with, with other members of my family to do this together because there's a different dynamic and there's a different power. There's a, a, a different magnification of God when we do it together. If you turn uh, just a few pages over to the left, how about that, to the book of Hebrews, there's a verse there that and, and it, it just reflects dozens of other verses with the same message. But it's a problematic verse. It is like one of many that is, we justify it and we rationalize it and we make excuses for it and we determine it's not really that big of a deal and we minimize what it says. But this is a verse that starts competing with your busy weekend. This is the verse that competes with all those other things that get between you and, and what God says. So, this is a big deal. Now, I know 
I'm going to go ahead and read the verse. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And we say, well, you know, but Jesus, he said, uh, Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that shouldn't, we, we can't be all legalistic about stuff all the time. And we, we gravitate toward being legalistic. And, you know, Jesus said, what happens if, if your sheep falls into a pit? Don't you go and rescue the sheep from the pit? Well, see, we're not rescuing sheep from pits. We're throwing sheep into pits. We've taken this thing about God's day, and we're just creating things that we've got to do on Sunday that's going to take us away from the corporate work. We are throwing sheep into pits that we would not have to do what God says to do. And this is another reason why American Christianity is just really an anemic version of it in the world. And why it's a lot more dynamic in other places. He says, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day is the day of Christ's return. And with every passing day, that day gets closer. When we'll all stand before God and give an account for our lives. And we'll answer for the things we have done and the things we have not done. And the Bible says, it is good for us to meet together so that we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And that's one of the things that we do here. We're, we're not good at spurring ourselves. And sometimes we need somebody else just to nudge us along. And we do that for one another. And we do that when we gather together and we share God's word. Whether it is in your Bible fellowship group or in here, we spur one another on. That wherever we are, that's not where God intends for us to park for the rest of our lives. The Bible says meeting together ought to be a habit, so we ought to do it every week. Second thing, God's will for us is to gather weekly. Now, when I say weekly, I did not say W-E-A-K-L-Y, which we do plenty of that, but W-E-E-K-L-Y. He says, not neglecting to meet together. Let us, why don't you say that with me? Not neglecting to meet together. Not neglecting to meet together. We need to keep working on reading things together, don't we? That, that little uh, word that's translated meeting together is uh, episunagogain. Episunagogain. There's your Greek word of the week. You can work that into conversation at work or school tomorrow. Episunagogain. Uh, epi means very expensive. You got to read a newspaper, people. Epi means in or upon. Now, I want you to listen carefully to the second. Epi, sunagogain, sunagogain, sunag, sounds like a Hebrew word, you know. Synagogue, the gathering place where God's people gather for worship. Uh, for us, in our, in our context, it's the church. Because we need what that meeting can do for us. We need to episynagogue because when we're here, we're more likely to take a step of growth. We're more likely to give God glory and not just on this day. And when you're not here, you can, there, there are a thousand and one things that aren't bad things that you can do somewhere else on the Lord's day. But the odds of you giving God glory and growing in him are very, very slim in those contexts. And again, we rationalize and justify and try to make it all work, but uh, it's not quite what God talks about in this word. Hebrews 10, let us not give up episunagoging. Uh, I added an I-N-G to a Greek word. I'm not sure that that is uh, legitimate, but meeting in the synagogue, the church. Now, the Bible describes a lot of positive habits that can help give us Give, give God glory. But gathering for weekly worship is not as insignificant as we seem to have made it in this part of the world. In fact, it, it is primary. This is a foundational habit that when this habit falls away, everything else is going to start to unravel quickly because this one resets our priorities for the week. This one refocuses us so the rest of the week lines up the way God wants it to line up. Now, I shared this in Deacon's meeting last month, and I want to share it with you. It's uh, 
my personal testimony, I've t- talked about bits and pieces of this, uh, as people have asked me about our missions efforts in our church, and, and I'm, I'm a guy from Victoria, Texas. I've never flown on an airplane until I was my third year of college. Uh, it was a pretty simple life I grew up living, and then uh, God's given me the opportunity to drag some of you with me onto the African continent eight different times in the course of the last several years. And when we think about Africa, because you hear news reports and you read stuff and see things about Africa, you think, oh, we need to go because we need to help those people because their needs are so many. And they are great. There's epidemic, epidemic disease and, and pandemic disease. And, and there's uh, extreme poverty and there's lack of education. All those things. And so we can go and we can, we can help with those things and certainly spiritual darkness. But when I go... And I take, and one of the commitments I made to the Lord is I would never, I, had a, I was asked this last week to go on a, a mission effort uh, with an organization. And they said, oh, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. And I said, well, I, I can't take anybody with me. And my commitment to the Lord is I'm never going unless I'm taking people from here with me. So uh, that's a part of my commitment. And when we go, we have goals and we come back with a list of things. Here's what we accomplished while we were doing what we set out to do. But at this point in my life, God has clarified something in my spirit. And my personal testimony, I have great experiences when I go to, to Africa. But I, I need Africa a lot worse than Africa needs me. Africa would be just fine without me. But I really need that boost because it helps me to reset my spiritual clock and my life priorities. Partly because it drops me into a third world environment like the first century church. And it clarifies some things that it gets so blurry in American Christianity. I, I need to see a cleaner version of it than that. And that's, that's the big reason I, I'm drawn to, to go. We are bombarded in our culture by messages from multiple sources and from all sorts of media about what's important and what's not important and what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad and our priorities start getting scrambled. And for me, these are the things that, as I was reflecting on why, when I came back from Tanzania this year, I'm impacted by the simplicity of it all. That stuff is not important in that culture. It's, man, we're so overwhelmed by stuff here. Life slows down, and people's joy doesn't come from what they have or where they go. It, it comes from relationships. And the believers I'm working with, relationship to God and relationship to other people. I'm always impacted by the community side of this. And we talked about community last Sunday. When I'm in that third world environment, the, the, the people do everything together. Like they farm together. They cook their meals together. They, they, do, they wash clothes together. They do everything together. And here's why. Because they know I can't survive here by myself. I, it, it's all going to go south on me if... If I don't have people around me, people that are in my life and a part of my life, and we need each other, and they know they need each other, because there's no safety net, there's no big insurance process, and there's no big government bailout for anything, they need each other. And I'm impacted by the spiritual side of things, that faith permeates life for them, and my faith gets so complicated. American Christianity faith gets really complicated because we add all these layers to it and it becomes a big academic, academic thing and it becomes complicated instead of the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and that's why I, I need to see that side of it on a regular basis, I've found. that I, I, was, I told the deacons, I was walking with a, a pastor. We were in a really rural area and... There's this bird just going nuts in a tree. Singing, 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 singing. And I said, my brother, that is one happy bird. And he said, the birds awaken to sing praises to God this day. And, you know, it's a real simple something that I think, well, I remember saying things like that to my kids when they were growing up. But I need to, I need to simplify my view of the faith. 
I need to feel every moment of the movement of God because those are the kinds of things that are read in the Psalms. That's how, that's how they express their faith. That God was a part of everything, not just siloed away over here or over here, but he was a part of day-to-day -day life. And I need an infusion of that for me personally to pull me back, to get me centered, to grow me where I need growing. So going there, it resets priorities for me in several areas. It, Jeff let us in sing it earlier. It tunes my heart to sing his praise. I need my heart retuned on a regular basis. And go on, you don't have to go to Africa to get this done because when we gather together at church, this is what we're supposed to be doing here is to tune our hearts to sing his praise, to, to get things focused in the right direction again, to get, to get life reoriented for the week that is just ahead of us. So that, and for some people like me, I just need a, re I need a really hard hit of it once a year, and I need a regular booster shot every Sunday to get things back to where they're supposed to be. And, and I, think, I think maybe in our, in our Americanized view of Christianity that... It shows up in our prayer requests and a lot of other stuff that don't we spend most of our time praying that our life would be easier? That everything would be problem free? That we'd never have any difficulties? And that like that's what it looks like to have a good relationship to God? But that's not what it looks like anywhere in the Bible. It's not what it looked like for the first century church. Um... And it's not what it looks like in the places where revival is white hot in the world today. And I don't know, I started praying a while back for myself. God, don't let me be so comfortable in, in this rich young ruler environment I live in in North Texas. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? He just had everything he needed. And he didn't need God because of it. And for a lot of people, even who have made a commitment to Christ... It's just way too easy. And it's so easy that we can manage it with or without God on any given day. And there's nothing that causes us to be driven by desperation to really trust in God. So I started praying for myself. God, don't let me forget that. And God, and certainly God brought some things into my life that have challenged me and caused me to have to pray differently and to lean into Him in different ways over uh, this time period I've been offering up that kind of prayer. God, don't, don't make me... Don't make my life easy. Make my life holy. And, and what, whatever that looks like. And I found myself uh, trusting the Lord. Maybe what we need to pray for one another. Why don't you take this to your Bible fellowship group? This will really surprise the people who didn't come to worship today. When you go to your class in a moment and you, you say, let's pray. Dear God, I pray that, that you would take us to our knees. By bringing things into our life that remind us we cannot do this without you. Amen. There'd be a lot of people that, what did he just say? Maybe we're praying for the wrong things in the wrong way. And that's why we've ended up where we are as a nation. All these inputs from media bombardment that we experience just cause us to view the to view God and the world and the people around us with a really distorted lens. and So where does that get corrected? Where do you get reminded? Where, where else do you get reminded? You are not necessarily the center of the universe. And where else do you, do you get reminded that the one with the most toys doesn't necessarily win at the end of the game? And that things that you buy and try and taste and wear aren't the things that are going to make you happy over the long term. The answer to those questions is you find that at the church. It's the only place going to tell you that stuff where true truth is going to be taught from God's word. In church, you hear this message that reminds us that the world, the world doesn't revolve around you. And that's a hard pill to swallow. A lot of people say, when the story stops being about me, I stop being interested in the story. And that says more about a relationship to God than just about any other measure. In the church, the songs, the message, the people you spend time with, the Lord's house, remind you that despite all that you've seen this week and the way you've seen people treated this week, people matter to God. And they ought to be treated in, as people precious to God, created in His image with dignity and respect. 
And whether they are like you or they're different from you in the image of God. At church, you're reminded that you're significant when the rest of the world tells you you're not, that you're treasured, that God has plans for your life. It's a church that reminds you God has a purpose for every person in this world. It reminds us that He wants you to contribute to, to the effort. It reminds you that character matters. And God wants you to act with integrity and honesty and justice and love and peace and patience and joy. One of the most important decisions you make every week is the decision that you're going to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Because at the church, you get the interior of your soul reset. Not just for a day, but for the week that's ahead. And your priorities get repositioned. Uh, and your sense of what's true is retuned to what's really right and what's really true, excellent, worthwhile in your life. So the challenge this week is to commit to, I'm not going to find everything else to fill this in. And if I don't have any other options, then I'll be a part of gathering with God's people. Uh, I want to challenge you to just be a part of this, to explore it, to see if it could be true. And this, again, works like community. When we worship, it can't be, okay. What do you have for me today? Did you sing songs I like? Did you not sing songs I like? Did I, Chad's hair today? Not really what I was looking for. He needs to change that. Is it, we 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 start we start sitting like we're at a movie, evaluating all of it instead of listening for God and bringing something to the game. Worship is, what do you bring into the game? What did you bring to the game today? Or did you sit back as a casual observer? Surprise me, amaze me, uh, overwhelm me, don't disappoint me. We've missed the purpose of gathering. Third thing, worship is a verb. And we have a, we have a video we want to show you, a testimony, one of our folks. Hi, my name is Rob and this is my story. For 30 plus years, I was paddling upstream with one oar doing what I wanted to do, making decisions that I wanted to make. But all that got me was an eye full of brokenness, an eye full of emptiness, an eye full of depression, and an eye full of sorrow. I experienced many dark times throughout my 30s with the family and extended family. Roller coaster rides of financial instability, high financial debt, I went through a very difficult divorce. It was obviously hard on everyone, including the children. My ex-wife had moved away for two years off and on, and the children were unable to see her for six months to a year at a time. I didn't want this or plan this, but God had an ultimate goal to bring myself and others closer to Him. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's ultimately the Lord's that will prevail. But looking back, instead of thinking, where was God during all this? He was right there next to me. I envisioned the whole time our Lord was just saying with his arms crossed, what in tarnation is that boy doing? He's flailing around, drowning in the sea of self, and I've had my arm extended to him this entire time. All he has to do is just reach out and grab my arm and let me lead the way. Just like Psalm 119 says, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is the Lord, the church, and Chick-fil-A that got me through all those difficult times. I am fortunate enough to work in a positive environment. I am surrounded by people who love the Lord. Our corporate purpose is to glorify the Lord by being a faithful steward to all that's entrusted to us and to have a positive influence upon all those that come in contact. One of my favorite verses is Colossians 3.23, which says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, do it for Him, no matter what it is, whether you're an executive, a nurse, a teacher, a garbage picker upper, uh, whatever you do, you're doing it for him. Some may know me as the bald-headed, bow-tied Chick-fil-A guy, but I really want to be known as the bald-headed, bow-tied Christian guy who serves the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Man, think about it. We get to serve the living Lord, the Lord of all creation. Worship isn't just something we do on Sundays. It's something that we do every day, all day, every day. As Pastor Jack Graham of Prestonwood Baptist Church so passionately said, 
Give cheerfully, serve humbly, and worship Him gladly. We have nothing to offer God except what He has already given us, a holy life. Thank Him every day for the wonderful blessings of being able to live for all His glory. I think Rob describes it really well. Worship is not a a noun, and that's how we use it most often, I think. Uh, It's not pointing to a person, place, or thing. It's a verb, and it describes an action. That's something you should do with, and as we've sung today, with every breath you take. Uh, Along with that, I also want to challenge you this week. Romans 12, 1, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, but I love it in the message. Here's how they say it, and it's a great way to describe it. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before the Lord as an offering. That's what a living sacrifice looks like. How can you do that? Well, there's some ways to do it. You're wired for worship, for episunagoging, and God asks you to be present to do that formally and regularly every seven days of the week. It shows partly just whose side you're on. It identifies you. It's a part of your testimony in your community, on your street, in your neighborhood. Back in Paul's day, the Jews would worship God. They'd bring a a lamb, they'd bring a bull, and they'd put it on an altar, cut its throat, and they would say, this is our offering to God. And this difference, instead of a dead sacrifice... It is a living sacrifice, as Paul describes it in Romans 12, that we are walking around sacrifices offered up to God all day long. So my iPhone gives Apple glory by doing what it does well. You give God glory by doing everything that you do in ways that bring glory to God, that point back to God. Uh, Friday. Friday's my usual day off from the office. And Friday... I was locked down because I had two different uh, folks come into the house to work on things that could be there sometime between 8 and 12. Uh, The second one came at 10 till 12. So I appreciated that very much. Um, So I had had time at the house. And I did several things around the house. and, And because Ron is teaching school... Are there things I do on my day off that I want to please her? And so one of the things that pleases her is uh, the dishes being washed. And so it's not one of my all-the-time jobs, but it's a regular job for me. And I wash dishes, and I got them all cleaned up. And you know what? Not as a begrudging thing, because I I know it blesses Rhonda, but worship is something you do with everything that you're doing. And so I want to please God. If I'm washing dishes. And so I was washing dishes. I'm standing there at the sink. And I'm looking out the window. Uh, toward, the, toward our street. And I just thank God. God that you gave me. That gave me hands to be able to wash dishes. And I thank you that I have a sink. To soak these dishes in. And I thank you that I have a towel to dry these dishes with. Because everything that I do. Connects with my relationship to God. Because my life can't be segmented. And. Think about this for you. Tomorrow morning when you get up, you say, I'm going to give glory to God and I'm going to thank Him for breath for another day and opportunities for whatever is before me. When you're driving to work, see, you knew it was going to get personal eventually. You're driving to work and that person cuts you off in traffic. Is this going to be an opportunity to give glory to God and to worship Him? Or is this a chance for you to undo all Christian testimony? And again, Please take those Christian bumper stickers off of your vehicle if you are not able to do this. Because I don't need you making things worse for me and for God's work in the world. But can you give God glory? Can you honor Him in how you you drive and how you treat other drivers? Uh, At work, you give God glory by working hard, by giving it your best, not just mailing it in, slacking off. Man, I hate to hear stories about Christians that they're the worst employee at their place of business. You ought to be the best. Leaning into it. If you're a student, children, obey your parents and uh, give glory to God by how you treat your teachers and the way you attack your homework. And 
And, and the easiest thing for any of us is just to slide off of that altar because that's the deal with the living sacrifice. We're always climbing down from the altar of sacrifice. But do your best. If it's an extracurricular activity, sports, it, your, your intensity and your teachability ought to reflect that you belong to God and you're, you're offering up your best in whatever you do. Rob shared this verse, Colossians 3, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. That's worship. Parents investing in your children and not just creating more stuff for them to do, but investing in the spiritual, the eternal side of your kids. A marriage that reflects what Christ wants, a marriage to reflect and honors Him. Developing character that reflects Christ. Serving God by serving and loving one another. Those are all acts of worship. Listen again to that uh, Re Romans 12, 1 from the message paraphrase. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going, or going to work, walking around life. And place it before, the, before God as an offering, an act of worship. And that's how you worship. And so let's worship. Because we were made to do this. And we're made to do this because of who God is and because of what God's done. And both sides of that and any piece of it is plenty of reason to say, I'm going to do this by doing what he said about gathering with God's people. And I'm going to do this by living a life that's going to please him in everything I do. Now... I hope that you're keeping up with your readings. This is not a big, burdensome reading assignment. But those daily devotionals, they have a lot in them. And it, you need to read one every day. And you need to do what it says to do. There's an activity every day. And you can say, oh yeah, I read that. Because, you know, we like to keep it as just a mental activity instead of an action. Well, you haven't done anything until you've done something with what you've... You haven't learned anything until you've done something with it. So, get involved. Reading those daily devotionals. Uh, be a part of our worship hours where we're going to talk about these things. You're going to read about it all week. We'll talk about it on Sunday in the worship hour in your Bible fellowship groups. And then, and by the way, we're talking, about, we're talking about the discipleship side of this, the spiritual growth side of this this next week. And our staff, again, we're doing this ahead of the rest of the church. And man, this is a good week. <laughs> these devotionals are fantastic this week. You don't want to miss this. If you haven't picked up one of those books yet, pick one up in the rotunda today as an added incentive. If you're a guest, you have one of those completed guest forms, go, to the, go there. We'll give you a book so you can join in with us uh, right now. If you're a member, you should have already gotten one anyway. If you haven't yet, stop by that desk and they'll fix you up. If you're not already in a Bible fellowship group, uh, an intentional Bible fellowship group that's leaning into what the Lord has for us, then uh, I encourage you, again, go by the Be the Church display, sign up. Be a part of this. And all, all through this challenge, what does it mean to really worship God? To love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength everywhere, all the time, whatever you're doing. Worship. We can do this. But we're probably going to have to do something different than we're doing it now. And that's good. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, I pray that today... You'd work in our hearts to draw us close to you. I, I pray that we, we would just see how big you are and forgive us for making you small. That we'd see how big and glorious and wonderful and loving and powerful you are and that it would change how we respond to you. That you're not our messenger boy, our errand boy. You're the king of kings and lord of lords. And may we, may we lean into you big vision of who you are and who we are in relationship to you. Lord, tune our hearts to sing your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God's speaking to you, working in some area in these things. What's he saying to you and, and, how, we, and how you respond? God's always speaking. The, the only thing is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Let's do something. Let God speak.